Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report. We have Harley Schlanger back from Europe. And uh, uh, one of the things that I used to practice when I was a teenager was juggling. But when they gave you the last ball, people would always test you. Can you throw four balls in here? Can you throw five balls? Eventually, the last ball, you dropped all the balls. And Obama and the globalists and the bankers are starting to be given the last ball, and they're going to drop them all. And uh, the good sign, the signs of that are the stupid trip by Obama to Israel and the actions of the European Central Bankers with Cyprus and, of course, the response of the KGB and uh, the Russians to the stupid moves by the Cyprus banks against their money. Uh, and the people of Cyprus and their response and their parliament to the so-called bailout and the incredibly arrogant response of the of the central bankers in Europe uh, tell, literally threatening not just a veiled threat but a real serious threat to literally every bank in Europe which means that we can have a bank run literally any hour any day now because of these stupid moves um, Harley what's going on you got some great quotes to start today off uh, let's start from the top well I'll start with a quote from Lyndon LaRouche who was on Alex Jones's show yesterday and what he said is that the whole thing could go kabloom tomorrow uh, right. The d- decision was made in Cyprus to keep the banks closed through at least next Tuesday. Now, right. here's the deal. Cyprus has a $10 billion, uh, 10 billion euro debt, which really they owe $17 billion. And it's a relatively small debt compared to Italy, which is $2.7 trillion, or Spain, which is over $1.5 trillion. And most of this debt is owed by governments because they've been taking over banks. And the Cyprus debt, a large part of it, comes from taking over the two largest banks in the country. And they did it because the two largest banks were engaged in speculation and basically are insolvent, as are almost every single bank in Europe right now. Now, what happened was that as the Cyprus crisis came to a head, and, and they've got to come up with 10 billion euros in the next two weeks, the European Union put a gun to the head of the Cyprus president, the new president, Anastasiadis, and they said to him, you have to come up with $5.8 billion out of the $10 billion that we need, and you're going to do it by placing a tax on everyone with a savings account in Cyprus. And so the European Union forced the Cyprus government to agree that they would take uh, 6.75% of everything in those accounts that had 100,000 euros or less, and 9.9% of every savings account with over 100,000 euros. This is thievery. It's stealing. It's yeah. saying that the people who have saved money through hard work, through uh, uh, keeping their expenses in line, putting money away for the future, are going to be hit with a tax to bail out crooks. Now, the, the, the fly in the ointment was that it had to go through the, the Cyprus parliament. And yesterday, by a vote, a, a near unanimous vote, 36 against the bailout plan, 19 abstained, and no one voted in favor of it. So Cyprus is the first government in Europe to stand up against the European Union, the European community, and the International Monetary Fund. The Speaker of the Parliament in in Cyprus said, by rejecting the terms of the European Union bailout, we are protecting the people of all member countries of the European Union. Because, of course, they could do this to anybody. And during the debate, uh, the Speaker, whose name is Omiru, said, no to new colonial bonds, no to subjugation, no to national dishonor and raw blackmail. Now, in response to that, Jörg Asmussen, who's a member of the board of directors of the European Central Bank, said that the ECB will pull the plug on the Cyprus banks. That is, no liquidity, and those banks will collapse unless they come through with this plan. And he said, here's his quote, and this is what you were referring to, we can only provide liquidity to solvent banks and the solvency of Cyprus banks cannot be assumed without an aid program. Now, what do you think all these bailouts have been about? They're about insolvent banks. Why did J.P. Morgan Chase get bailed out? Why did Citibank get bailed out? Bank well, of America, by the way, they get Royal bailed Bank of Scotland, BNP Paribas. 
Right. All of them yeah. have been bailed All out them. with trillions of dollars because they're insolvent. Right, so but they're bailed out. They're bailed out because they created artificial money, ghost money, out of thin air. They yeah. created gambling schemes using derivatives and mortgage-backed securities to the tune of quadrillions of dollars total worldwide. And then they asked the governments to bail it out on the backs of the citizens to create austerity fascism, which is a form of economic eugenicide. And, and they wanted people saying, to cooperate fact, with this and say, if you don't accept this, we're going to pull the plug now. It's like a terrorist comes into your home and says, now, unless you give me your firstborn son and daughter, I'm going to blow your house up. It's like, what's the point? Well, in fact, in the debate yesterday, uh, one of the participants said that this policy is financial genocide. Now, I want to yeah, give you one other is, yeah. quote, though, from Schäuble, yeah. the German finance minister, because the Germans are pushing this partly because the German banks are so heavily exposed. And Schäuble said that the European Central Bank has made it clear that without a reform program for Cyprus, the aid will not continue. And then he said two big Cyprus banks are insolvent without emergency funds from the European Central Bank. I think there's a danger they won't be able to open the banks ever again. Now, well, what kind of message does that send to the banks across Europe? Or banks interlocking debt worldwide? Most people don't realize that overnight these banks exchange trillions of dollars of money worldwide. And if the banks in Cyprus go down, and this kind of message is sent to institutional investors, which will hide this for a few days or weeks, but eventually gets through to the public who will start pulling their money from banks, not only in Europe but worldwide, we're going to have a bank run like 1929. Well, we've already seen the, the, uh, the, the reason they shut the banks in Cyprus is people were going to pull their money out. We're right. seeing reactions in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, also in France, in, in Britain. And I would be surprised if there aren't people in the United States concerned about the situation here. Now, there's one well, other aspect, and I know we're coming up toward the break, but the other aspect of the Cyprus situation is the Russian side. Because a yeah, lot the KGB, of KGB, this is money, a KGB money that has been put in Cyprus banks, right? Exactly. And, and they have the idea that if you're a Russian multimillionaire who wants to do business in Europe, and you want to have a bank that, that can help you, a lot of them went to Cyprus. And now these corporations and these Russian businesses are about to be hit with huge taxes. And some people are saying that, in fact, this is a way of punishing Russia. Now, the Russians have a different view. Yeah, bad idea. Say, this is unjust. This is uh, undescribably stupid. And Putin said this is not acceptable. And it's an act of war is what it is. The minister of it's... Cyprus was in Russia to talk to the yeah. Russians, and they were hoping the Russians might give them a bailout. But the Russians had two meetings with them, and they said, well, we're not ready to bail you out yet. Uh, the Russians already have given them two and a half billion euros to keep their banks going the last time around. But the Russians are driving a bargain because they want a port in the Mediterranean. And Cyprus has a very good port. And the Russian-Cyprus relations are fairly good. So what we're seeing is the shift of a weak and collapsing transatlantic system coming up against right. the boundary condition of debt. And Russia, which has a little bit of liquidity because of their oil and gas, uh, able to play a role outside of that. And now we're yeah. also seeing the possibility that the BRIC nations, which include Brazil, Russia, India, and China, are going to be brought in not only on this, but also to help with the situation in Syria. So we're seeing a potential dramatic shift strategically uh, while Obama's car is breaking down on the tarmac in Israel. Yeah, right. You mentioned how they put diesel instead of regular gasoline in the beast. His yeah. vehicle flown over on the C Hercules C-130 so it would never get out of the tarmac. That's right. Uh, amazing. Uh, a, 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 Keystone cops visit by the abominator, the usurper in chief, the liar. Amazing. Back in a moment with more amazing, awful news. Welcome back, and uh, you know, 
as I said, my spidey sense tells me that there's a number of, of what we call parallel catastrophes that are brewing. We've got so many things that are parallel and are just, you know, ready, as they say in the, the novel Moby Dick, ready to blow. Uh, Europe, Cyprus is ready to blow. Fukushima has been a station blackout uh, for power for days. Now it's finally completely stationed blackout, and they're ready to have a pyrophoric explosion. We've got North and South Korea. The armistice is off after 60-some years. We've got China and Japan at it over the Kuril Islands. We've got Europe ready to melt down and, and stupid moves. I mean, even self-destructive moves on the part of the European Central Bank and these international bankers, uh, they don't even listen to their own advice. Well, there are two reasons that this is, two potential explanations for this, and this comes from LaRouche's webcast last Friday night, uh, and that was before the Cyprus thing really went into high gear. And what LaRouche said is that, look, if you look at Cyprus, 10 billion euros is nothing, as I said, compared to Italy or Spain or countries like that or Britain. It's nothing. Why right. did they make such a blatant move to steal people's money, knowing that this would set off an alarm and set off a reaction worldwide? He said there are two possibilities. One is some of the people involved in this are panicked because they've reached the limit of bailouts. They can't come up with more money. And they're at the point where they literally are moving to steal it and take it from people's livelihood and throw people into the sewer, which is what they've done in Greece. Now, the second explanation is that within that broader grouping of policymakers, there's a smaller group that with a very cool head is saying, let's blow the thing up now, either with hyperinflation or a deflationary blowout. And as the thing collapses, a small group will get together and reorganize, and, and this is where you get your global banker's dictatorship. Right. So you have these two options as to what's behind this clumsy, stupid move with Cyprus. Yeah, now, in other words, what you're saying is a controlled demolition now so that they can regroup and rebuild the building. Either that Only they'll or have to absolute control and have a, ha buy everything in their fire sales, what they're going to do. Yeah, and the other part of it is there's some people who are figuring bailing out Cyprus is not a solution, but it buys us a little more time to try and come up with something. Now, because they realize that austerity is not working, austerity and taxes, what Obama's pushing for in the United States, the so-called grand bargain, this isn't going to work. Now, there's a third option, which is that we simply go with Glass-Steagall on a global basis, and we say no government is going to recognize the debt of the speculators. That's up to the speculators to deleverage and, and allow it to melt down. And if they go out of business, so what? That's good for the world. But with Glass-Steagall, you'd protect the savings, protect the deposits, and protect the banks as functioning institutions. Now, here's the two pieces of good news in all this. The first is that the government of Cyprus stood up to the empire and said, no, we're not going to go with your policy. Now, they did that with the gun to their head. They did it where Greece didn't do it, Italy didn't do it, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, every one of those countries, which are bigger countries, knuckled under. So this is the first example of a European Union member that said, we're not knuckling under. Secondly, a non-European Union member, but one that's very much connected to the European Union, Iceland, Right. Its parliament just had a vote in their economic and finance committee, unanimous vote to go with Glass-Steagall for, for Iceland's banking system. Now, the third bit of good news is that a country in Europe, which is part of the, European, the Council of Europe, but it's not part of the European Union, San Marino, where I gave a speech about a week and a half ago, they have a Glass-Steagall resolution uh, before their parliament. So we've seen now two nations introduce Glass-Steagall uh, as a parliamentary policy, and a third nation stand up to the EU and say, we're not drinking your poison. Now, what about us? What about the United States? That's the issue, and we have to force it in the United States, because what's happening in Cyprus, what's happening in Greece, that's what Obama intends for the United States. And the Republicans will go along with them in a heartbeat. Yeah, the Republicans, basically, their behavior 
means that if they don't, they had the CPAC meeting and they had a uh, uh, number of speakers get up, including Sarah Palin. But I'm not impressed. The uh, approach of all of them is they're going to rewrite and support America. What you need to do is you need to get real. They need to stop being the other component of the dual component single party system which we currently have. Right. Well, we have a single party that has a democratic, crazy, communist, progressive component, and we have the fascist component of the Republicans that want to shove austerity fascism down our throat. Neither of these are solutions to the problem. Well, see, I, the Democratic, the, the people who are supporting Obama are just as fascist as the Republicans. They're corporate. They're just a different form. They're, just, well, the Republicans they're, they're both don't noxious know that they're and deadly. Corporate fascists. People yeah. like Obama probably do know they are. But it's the same policy. It's a corporate-based policy where you protect speculators and you kill people. And this is, you know, it's ironic that some of the conservatives who claim to be the most uh, pro-life and they'll stand up and fight abortion until they're blue in the face, but then they turn around with policies and end up killing the elderly and killing the poor. Exactly. I don't buy it. I, you know, people need to see through this and realize that neither party has their feet on the ground. Neither. Now, there's an interesting thing that's starting to happen, which uh, has really taken off, which is Democratic Party uh, rebellion against Obama. Now, it's still contained, but it's interesting because it's people who are retiring. People like Senator Levin in Michigan, who's not a very good guy, but is the one who's fighting to try and get uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's Jamie Dimon indicted after his ridiculous, his bank's ridiculous performance last week in uh, lying before the Congress. Uh, Tom Harkin, who's retiring, a senator from Iowa, who oftentimes is out in left field, but Harkin came out attacking Obama for his, what he called, whacking away at Social Security and Medicare. And then Jay Rockefeller, whose grandfather was one of the founders of the Population Council, Jay Rockefeller stood his ground and attacked Obama on the drone policy in the caucus. And Obama said, look, we're not talking about Dick Cheney here. And instead of getting a laugh out of that, the Democrats sat there silently fuming. Because, of course, Dick Cheney supports what Obama is doing on the drone. He's in the background with, with his horn and his cracker, and he's hooping it up and saying, Go Obama, you're out doing Bush and me. You're following the, you know, the, the program totally. I mean, I and can't believe that Obama has a nerve to say that. There were 135 House Democrats who said they would not support Obama if he attacked Social Security and, and Medicare. And then Bernie Sanders made a simple point, which is so true. What does Social Security have to do with the budget deficit? It doesn't add a penny to the deficit. It's got a $2.7 trillion surplus, and it's paid for with a payroll tax. Exactly. It has not, it's not even on the same balance sheet. Right? Whoa. It's ridiculous. I saw an article that says, you know, that the budget of Paul Ryan is not conservative. When the 3.6% increase in spending every year is occurring, when slashing and burning Medicare and Medicaid and talking about Social Security as if it's somehow part of the budget when it's not, is totally off the budget uh, sheet, uh, funded by payroll taxes, it's, it's evil. It's actually very deceptive to try to do this. But I don't find Obama's approach any better. So neither of these approaches makes any sense. You don't. You need to control costs. But when they wrote the Obamacare bill, they rather than reduce the cost of drugs and equipment and so on. They decided they're going to use austerity fascism and set up a 15-member panel. Even before the Obamacare bill was passed a year later in 2010, they'd already had this panel appointed within three days of the bank bailout, and Obama appointed all 15 members of this so-called death panel, which Sarah Palin talked about. And by the way, she didn't come up with the idea. It was her advisors that did have a clue. What's going on now is mismanagement to a monumental level. 
unbelievable dis- disarray and neither party is approaching this with common sense or decency thinking that they're going to get a pass either conservative democrats or republicans that actually have a heart and realize that the policies of either party if they get away with it will kill people will well, destroy economies and will make us weak militarily which is was going to invite war uh... not only with our ally israel but our allies in europe and invite economic chaos i mean Obama's well, business is a perfect real example issue, because we've been so fixated since the election and, and for the last 15 years on the question of budget deficits and you know the when you sometimes you need deficits when you're fighting a war when you're dealing with imminent crises you have to come up with money for example just as a perfectly decent case with all the mishandling the bush administration did of hurricane katrina Afterwards, they did champion the idea of building new levees. And so when another hurricane hit about three years ago or two years ago, uh, New Orleans was protected. Now, there are times, therefore, that you move new technologies and and new infrastructure projects for the sake of, of the future. And they more than pay for themselves by virtue of the fact that you didn't have New Orleans destroyed again. Now, the problem is that you get people like Paul Ryan who don't distinguish between debt that's incorporated into a credit uh, generation to build a steel mill and debt to pay off bad bank debt. They treat it all as one quantity, one quality rather. And so they say, well, we have to cut it, we have to cut it. Well, paying money from the government to keep people alive is, may cost some money, but it's a good policy, especially if some of the people you're keeping alive have been productive members of society. Because you're saying to every young child, we're going to take care of our population and make sure we have programs so that you'll have adequate health care. Now, if you don't do that, you're back in the... the middle of the 19th century so-called Manchester free trade capitalism where you turn everyone into a, a, a wage slave except the aristocrats who control the banks and that's exactly where we are today yeah what we're doing is a concentration of power in the handle of bankers that even supersedes the power of governments to make money to coin money instead of credit so what it does is it makes basically every federal government of every nation irrelevant because the international bankers are in total control of credit because they've collapsed the system. Well, they're irrelevant except for two things. One is they have to enforce the austerity. And secondly, they commit the whatever profit generation there is in the society to bail out the banks. I don't see how that model can work, though, because the banks. Because I don't see how politicians in any country can expect to survive politically if they're acting as agents of bankers that are basically ripping off and destroying the public. Well, that's why the Cyprus vote was so important, because when the government went in to negotiate and they were told, look, your banks are going to collapse, which means your government's going to collapse, you're going to be cut off of credit, and if you take an island like Cyprus and you cut them off with credit, you're going to have people starving pretty soon. You're going to have food riots. You're going to have gasoline shortages. And so the government of Cyprus initially, and this was a government just elected three weeks ago, they said, right. okay, we'll accept this plan. And then as soon as they sat down in the parliament and said, how the hell are we going to pass it? There were demonstrators in the street saying, we're not going to let you pass this. And to their credit, the as I said, not a single member of the parliament of Cyprus voted in support of this European Union uh, theft plan. And so that's the first time that a nation has stood up to the IMF, the uh, European Union, and and the EC. By the way, here's an interesting thing. I I should have mentioned this earlier. Christine Lagarde, who replaced uh, the the, uh, whoremonger from the IMF, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, Lagarde went from finance minister of France, the head of the IMF. She said that the levy should be 30 to 40 percent not 9.9 percent. Well, well that, that was a proposed over a 20,000 euro limit where you get zero. And of course, you can imagine that was seizure level for anybody with money over that, including the KGB that had their money invested in Cyprus banks. 
uh, the KGB have ways of dealing with you when you mess with them like that. Like all your relatives' genitals end up in plastic bags at the front doorstep of your home after their body's been sliced up and dropped in a dump. Well, I mean, people don't understand that this is the kind of stuff that gets you killed. This is the let kind let of me stuff give you that... the kicker on Christine Lagarde, though, because here she is. She, she's, she's proposing crazy. that you take 30 to 40 percent levies. Now, today, her apartment was raided by French financial police about a crooked deal she worked with one of Sarkozy's top supporters, a guy named Bernard Tapier, right. uh, to give him $500 million. Uh, and in return, he kicked into the Sarkozy campaign. So here's right. Lagarde caught in a huge financial scandal, even while she's trying to talk about taking money from uh, poor savers in Cyprus. How do you say that the word that all of the herd of the predator class of the international global elite are not of one mind? In other words, <laughs> uh, she's basically pissed off enough of the globalists on the other side of the fence. They're ready to eat her alive. And I don't think this is a wise move on her part or a move that can even get her not put into prison or worse. Well, it's, so, it's going to happen. You know, uh, uh, Strauss Kahn is the guy I was thinking of. He was her president yeah, Strauss Kahn. the IMF. And he, he, and he ticked off the right wrong people, too. You know yeah. he was taken out because he ticked off the wrong people. Lagarde is playing the same dangerous game, and she's going to get removed as well. Well, and, and what you find is that the, these global elite are not that loyal, and they will eat their own. I mean, you're talking exactly. about people who are in favor of genocide on a global scale. And so you can't, they can't even trust each other. You know, Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, uh, last Wednesday said we've, Europe has now turned the corner. And then, of course, maybe this is the case of turning the corner and you run into the freight train around the other end of the corner. <laughs> So a good analogy would be that Christine Lagarde and the other bankers like monitor lizards will eat each other's eggs. Yeah, and, and in fact, eventually they find a grown lizard that doesn't like them doing it that eats them. Right, exactly. And that, that's what happens with monitor lizards. So my guess is we're probably days to weeks again uh, away from a bank run in Europe. I think you know, and here's what, what they have about a bank holiday. That's what they have right. in Cyprus right now. The banks are right. shut well, down. But, well, here's the scenario that I see. Uh, I think that the warning in Cyprus means that the banks and the derivatives markets cannot make money. We talked about this last week with our financial experts. The the the, the ghost money. We had Blow Ponte on there again this Monday. They can't make money now with the derivatives market ratios anymore. Even ghost money can't make money. So four major stories that will have to post it up. Cyprus, the Euro Bank heist and the international bank run. I believe we're on the edge of a bank run in Europe, and I think we're going to see a bank holiday here very soon in America with the abominator, which basically is a devaluation. There's really three options. You either devalue the currency, allow hyperinflation, or you do theft like they try to do in Cyprus, which is the most noxious of the three, the most obvious, and obviously will produce an immediate response by the public no matter what nation. Or, uh, it's good. Yeah. Or you and, go and, with Glass-Steagall. And let yeah, me tell last you, deal, if you don't, by the way, you can, there will be a special webcast from LaRouche because you know when everyone else was saying the crisis is over, things have been resolved, LaRouche has been consistent in his analysis and staying on focus of the difference between a physical economy based on a credit system and Glass-Steagall versus one form or another of a speculative swindle. And he'll right. be speaking Friday night, 8 p.m. Centri- uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on LaRouchePack.com. Now, the next day, uh, this Saturday, March 23rd, is the 30-year anniversary of Ronald Reagan's adoption of the Strategic Defense Initiative as U.S. policy. And what a lot of people don't know about that, uh, the, the media has rewritten that to say that the Strategic Defense Initiative was 
uh, General Danny Graham's idea of using existing technology to put basically space pebbles and junk up in the way of nuclear weapons. But the original idea of the SDI came from LaRouche in collaboration with Edward Teller and some of the young scientists working with Dr. Edward Teller. And LaRouche was the one back in 1977, after Carter first got in, LaRouche wrote a pamphlet called The Sputnik of the 80s. And this became the basis of his intervention in the scientific community and with the military that got to the desk of Ronald Reagan. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a famous picture of a debate in the New Hampshire primary in 1980 where LaRouche was sitting next to Reagan and they were having a discussion. And this led to the Reagan administration national security advisor, Judge Clark, bringing LaRouche in to negotiate with the Soviets as to whether or not they would accept an offer from Reagan for a joint deployment of a strategic defense initiative based on developing weapons with new physical principles. That is not brilliant pebbles, not space junk, but uh, beam weapons. And this was rejected at the time. It was actually March 23, 1983, when Reagan made the proposal. He was immediately attacked by Kissinger, by Moynihan, by Ted Kennedy, and they attacked Reagan for working with LaRouche. Now, here we are 30 years later, and Putin's top people, including Dmitry Rogozin, the, the uh, deputy prime minister, is calling on the United States and the Russians to collaborate on these kinds of systems, both to protect against potential rogue weapons, but more importantly, to develop what Rogozin is calling a strategic defense of the Earth. Right. And In fact, uh, th this is one of the things that there's a linkage with with uh, Hegel, the new uh, defense minister, dismantling the uh, missile systems of defense in Poland, which, to be honest with you, it's kind of stupid to put a launch phase missile defense when you can't put one out in the ocean to stop missiles launched from submarine-launched Russian nuclear submarines. So it was at the just same a, time, it was a provocation from the beginning of the Exactly. Russia. In other words, it basically pushes the envelope to cause another race war, when really it's, uh, the issue is we had seven asteroids that could be city killers zip past the Earth just last week. We have a whole array of comets that are being pushed in from the Oort cloud by a red dwarf star, which we know is passing through our solar system. Uh, we have uh, three of them. We just had the... In the last few days, the pan stars, we have Lemon coming up in April, and in November we have the largest comet probably in human history that could pass close enough to the sun to cause a solar superstorm. And these objects, many of them are completely missed. These seven asteroids zip past the Earth. I know, having had clearance at U.S. Space Command, that uh, our resources are stretched beyond their capacity. We only pick up less than 2% of the objects that could be city killers, and as a result, without collaboration with Russia and other countries, we could have a major catastrophe on the planet. Not only that, we don't protect against coronal mass ejections, uh, against superstorms or space weather. And as a result, we put the entire planet in danger of an object that caused the death of the dinosaurs. And well, here's, and instead, here's the irony. 30 yeah. years after LaRouche proposed it, Reagan adopted it, and the Soviets rejected it. Now the Russians are offering that kind of cooperation. Uh, right. General Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is, is in Moscow meeting with the Russians to discuss it. But we have a right. president who's tearing apart NASA, destroying NASA. And the head of NASA, Holdren, when he was asked in hearings the other day by Representative Lamar Smith of Texas, well, what, what do we do in the face of these city-killing asteroids? And Holdren said, pray. Now, that's not the response you want. You want someone well, who would say, we're going to figure out how to find these things quicker and see what we can do to protect ourselves from actually, them. Actually, knowing, knowing what kind of policy he has for population reduction, I'm sure the word isn't appropriate for him to say, pray, how about duck? Uh, the whole well, idea, to, to me, is that... Start digging your grave is what some of them would say. Yeah, well, the problem is, you see, we're in, a, in an area of space that uh, passes every 20 six million years. We're in an area of space for passing through the galactic plane. We're in an area of space where the chances of a nearer space object striking the Earth with an asteroid or being affected by a comet, including a CME that explodes from the sun, 
is much, much more likely. We know that. That's why this is the year of the comet. And yet, instead of collaborating with other nations, with advanced physicists like Russians, Chinese, and Japanese, etc., instead of collaborating with Canadian and other scientists, what we have is a, a parochial attitude where they're basically making everything in space uh, research go black op. So the public space program of NASA is dead under Obama. I mean, it's even worse than that because you have this green policy, which essentially says we can't do anything about these things. Nature is more powerful than man, and we're just here as a, as a kind of uh, puzzle why we're here. Or well, Nick- one, of the, one of the solutions I would recommend, and it's very simple, knowing a little bit of astrophysics, is, is that we put out inside the Allen radiation belt a net of carbon fibers. Uh, we could simply aim this to deflect coronal mass ejections and objects from space uh, fairly simply because of the inertial momentum transfer. And all you have to do is deviate any object or a CMA by a matter of, of, of degrees, a couple degrees, and you can make it evade the Earth. The well, fact there, is we're not doing... There are things we can do, and, and that's yeah. the whole point. Just as there are things we can do about bankruptcy. Instead of right. imposing austerity conditions, we can take the people who run banks into the ground and put them in prison because many of them have committed fraud. And so there are things we can do, and that's the whole point. The American people should look at what Reagan proposed 30 years ago. Look at LaRouche's forecasting that went into that and LaRouche's warnings today of the crisis and his solutions. And what people ought to do is get on the horn and just make your congressman miserable if they haven't joined the Glass-Steagall fight. We now have 40 signers of the Glass-Steagall resolution in the House. We well, still I'm going to be meeting Daryl sponsor, and we ought to yeah, get I, one pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm going to meet Daryl Issa in the next few weeks, and I've been continuing to bug their office to get in a personal meeting. Who's head of the Finance Committee in Congress? And he just happens to be our uh, congressman from Vista, California. It turns out I'm very lucky that he lives literally within a mile of where I live. Well, get him on this because he's been grandstanding a lot, and the net effect of it has been zero. But if right. The problem is you can grandstand like all you want, but if Republicans you... like Walter Jones and Kaufman of Colorado to bring more Republicans into this, we could have a bipartisan coalition that would destroy Obama and destroy the control of the banksters. The fact is, that it's like you said, it's like one of those Christmas toys. If you play with part of one of the springs, the head will pop off. As soon as you set up Glass Steagall, Obama will go will go postal, as they say. Yep. Uh, and he'll do things that'll get him himself impeached or put in a loony bin very quickly once he realizes that his masters realize that the end of the banking scamster uh, schemes by the global bankers is over. That's right. Because he basically he's a banker boy. Ultimately, Nero kills himself. You have to protect exactly. Obama under these circumstances from himself. Right. Yeah, you got to protect him from himself. Exactly. Like uh, the stupid moves that he's made. Yeah. His comments about Iran, saying, you know, we like the Iranian people, but not the Iranian government. Even if you know and believe that, you don't make a public statement like that on a tour of the Middle East. Nope. We're trying to stop a uh, thermonuclear war. When you can't even Pretty get crazy. your car off the tarmac. Yeah, well, he's incompetent. If I had one word for Obama, it would be rookie. He doesn't know what he's doing. Amazing. Apparently, um, it's bad news, but there's always, there's always a solution, and we lay it out here. You do it at LaRouche uh, PAC and LaRoucheBUB.com. You do every day. Hour number two coming up, hour three, with Dr. Orly Tates and the latest of the birth movement. You don't want to miss it.